rainwater had been driven right into the house. Well, suddenly, a wall of water poured through the back door of the little kitchen. The phone had gone out, and we were so scared we couldn't breathe. Tuesday, September 20th, 1938. Along the northeast coast of the United States, families are enjoying the last days of their summer by the shore. We had lots of friends, and it was just innocent children's play. I mean, we bicycled, we went to the movies, we went to the beach, and just had a, it was a lovely, lovely time. In the fishing community of Jamestown, Rhode Island, Norm Caswell takes his usual busload of children home from school. Caswell knows his passengers well, and he knows they're good kids. Though he does have to keep an eye on Clayton Chellis, the lighthouse keeper's 11-year-old son. Clayton Chellis? He was a, a rounder. He was, if it was something to get into, he got into it. <laughs> And uh, he could swim like a seal in the water. One of Clayton's favorite swimming spots is among the jagged rocks surrounding the Beaver Tail Lighthouse where his family lives. But in this weather, Clayton's swim will have to wait for another day. About 40 miles away, on Napa Tree Point in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, the Moore children play at their summer home, a place they call Heaven on Earth. Oops. Their father, Jeff Moore, runs a successful elastic factory. A former high school football captain, he once led his team to a 122 to nothing victory. Since his days of gridiron glory, he's bulked up to more than 200 pounds. He's known as a down-to-earth and generous man, to both his family and his employees. If a woman was pregnant, needed some money, he would reach in his pockets and pull out money, which was like lettuce, and give it to her. Hey, Mom. Hey, sweetie, come on up here. During the summer months, the Moore children notice a difference in their mother, Catherine. You get me wet. Oh, hey, Mom's turn of the husband and wife she was a bit more reserved but the children said when they got to the shore um, she was um, a little lighter hearted a little more fun they really went there to relax and kick back the family's three-story home nestled between little narragansett bay and the atlantic ocean is built on a barrier beach the barrier beaches are a ribbon of sand that juts right out along the seashore and behind them is the pond or waterway. It's wonderful living, but they're very, very vulnerable in a storm. Forty miles away, rain is falling in Connecticut. That evening, actress Katherine Hepburn is relaxing in front of the fireplace at her family home in Fenwick. She ponders her tumultuous relationship with movie mogul Howard Hughes, who has recently proposed to her. At that point, Hepburn did not want to marry Hughes. And I think it was mostly because her career was in such a terrible place at that point. And I think it was very important to her to remain independent and to bring herself back. For her comeback, she mulls over whether to lobby for the role of Scarlett O'Hara or to star in a new play a friend is writing for her. It was the story of a young woman who had divorced her husband and was about to marry another man and, and it was what happens during the weekend of that particular wedding. It was, of course, the Philadelphia story. Unbeknownst to Hepburn and millions of others on the Northeast Coast, they are in the crosshairs of a violent hurricane. A tropical 
tropical disturbance of dangerous proportions. Just one day earlier, meteorologists Grady Norton and Gordon Dunn predicted it was going to hit 1,400 miles south in Miami. They now assume the hurricane will follow a familiar pattern and disintegrate once it hits the cool waters off New England. By 9 p.m., the hurricane is lurking somewhere southeast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. But instead of dying off, it's growing more powerful due to a rare convergence. When hurricanes get this far north and they begin to interact with a cold front, well, that front represents temperature contrast. So when you put the two together, Mother Nature is trying to get that hurricane to be more like a winter-like system. These temperature contrasts, along with the jet stream, a river of air roaring through the atmosphere, cause the hurricane to grow larger and transform it into what is called an extratropical cyclone. It is a transition that, by definition, can possess remarkable amounts of energy, power in the atmosphere. And if they are directed toward a coastline, can have dramatic results. The jet stream greatly expands the reach of wind and rain generated by the hurricane, giving it the potential to strike an area more than 500 miles wide. And it helps double the hurricane's speed to over 40 miles an hour. It is now one of the fastest on record, moving so rapidly that it doesn't have time to die out over the cold waters of the North Atlantic. But weather service warnings have cautioned most ships to evacuate the area. And without the sailors' first-hand reports, government meteorologists are unaware that the gigantic storm is racing toward the millions of people who live in the Northeast. Back in Watch Hill, Rhode Island, the Moore children prepare for bed. Mommy, it's been raining a lot lately. Yes, it has. Before going to sleep, eight-year-old Kathy Moore quizzes her mother about the recent spell of rainy weather. The subject was storms, typhoons, and so forth and so on, and my mother was explaining the difference between them to me. Kathy remembers saying, what is a hurricane? And her mother saying, oh, don't worry about it. Hurricanes don't come to New England. Okay. Next People had no clue that one of nature's most powerful historical weather events was about to come crashing ashore. Even veteran forecasters at the Washington, D.C. Weather Bureau are certain that the hurricane will never make landfall. A young meteorologist will discover the storm's actual path. Will anyone listen to his warnings? Levees, they collapse.